Okay, um, so to do midterm grades, um, this is just a, a quick crash course on how to set that up. Um, I hope that I actually have grades. Let me find a class that has grades in it, <clears throat> and then I will show you what that can look like. So in a class, you will just go into your class, you will go to assessments, then you will go to grades. And I don't know if you even know this is up there, but there are four little tabs across the top. Uh, there are no students in this class with grades, so um, there aren't anything on this page. But for manage grades, um, you click on that. And then the items that are available in your gradebook will show up for you. And then um, the, and I don't, am I screen sharing? Because I feel like I might not be. No, we can no. Nope. No. I'm showing y'all all this stuff and I'm not even sharing it with you. That's real helpful, isn't it? Um, so let's just start that all over again. <laughs> from, from your course homepage, um, you'll go to assessments and then you'll go to grades. And then up at the top, there are four little tabs. There's inner grades, manage grades, schemes, and setup wizard. Uh, setup wizard is how you set it up in the beginning. Um, and then uh, manage grades is what we're going to look at for this. So we're going to go to manage grades and it will show you all of the grading that is available in your gradebook for the course for what's been set up. To set up a midterm calculated grade, since those are due today, um, you go to new, <coughs> you go to item, and then you're going to go down, to, it's the fifth one down or the next to bottom one, there's only six. So it's the fifth one down and you're going to go to calculated. And then we're going to create a new item and we're just going to call this one midterm, assuming I can spell midterm. You don't really need to worry about the short name. You don't really need to worry about the description so much. Um, only if the way that yours is set up that you're going to end up at a, a point that it's possible for somebody to have over 100% do you need to worry about the can exceed. That is very rare. So you don't need to worry about it, but if you're concerned, go ahead and click it. It's not going to hurt anything to have it. Um, then all you're going to do is go look at the items that you have available in your course and pick the ones you want to associate with your midterm grade. So for this one, we are uh, going to associate our introductory post, our um, assignment one, and our syllabus quiz. We don't have a rubric because it is just a calculation of grades. If your grades happen to be weighted in categories, you get another little question uh, right around in here that asks if it is um, at a midpoint or if it is part of the final calculation, go ahead and click midpoint. Now what that means is that if you have a setting that is allowing for grades uh, in a category for the lowest to be dropped in your midterm the lowest is not going to be dropped it's not going to associate that yet it is literally just taking all of the grades that have been submitted at this point um, so just be aware of that but once you've selected the ones you want you hit save and close and that item now shows up in your midterm. Now I like for mine to show up as hidden to begin with, so the little eyeball with the line through it, so that I can then go in and take a look at like one person's grading and make sure that it did it the way that I wanted it to before it releases it to the whole class. Um, Cause if, you, if you're not certain and not super confident about what's going on with it, um, then you're gonna wanna double check that. So this is a midterm grade. Um, to set it as hidden, you literally just click on that arrow and go to hide from users. Um, it makes it hidden. So what would happen if I actually had grades in this um, on the inner grades page when you go back to inner grades, you would have your students listed on the left hand side and then you would have the grades of what they've completed and then you would have a midterm average. So you can then log into Banner and you can have your D2L page set up right there and you can look at your Banner list and you can look at your D2L list and it tells you exactly what your midterm grade is based on the items that you selected to be included in your midterm. Um, so that is all that is to create a midterm grade. So if y'all have not submitted those yet, 
uh, there is your little trick tidbit for the day. Um, and uh, that is that. Does anybody have any questions about midterms before we go into quizzes? Yeah, is this the one where it displays whether it's an A or a B or a, or does it display actual numbers as the grade? It displays actual numbers unless yours is set to display letter grades. Um, so the automatic setup in D2L, unless you go in and change it, is for it to be numbers and then a color scheme. So um, the color scheme, blue is A, green is B, yellow is C, and then uh, D and lower are various shades of red. Um, so you can kind of tell just from the, uh, the color scheme, but it's numbers unless you go in and you set it to be as letter grades within your grades. So you might still have to do a little bit of, of thinking about what you want with that, but it, it will show up with the averages to that point. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions on setting up midterms before we talk about quizzes? All right, then we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about quizzes. So, um, so I know we took a little bit of a tangent there. I hope that y'all are okay with us uh, starting the quiz one just a little bit later. Uh, so to get started about quizzes, um, again, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am one of the instructional designers for MTSU Online and um, our other MTSU Online instructional designer, Tara Perrin, is here today to monitor the chat. So if you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask those in the chat. Uh, and some of them she'll be able to answer as we go. Others she will, I'm sure, make sure that I answer them um, if I skip past something or if there's a question that that needs to be answered at that time. Uh, so to, I do this at the beginning of every one of our sessions, so I just want to let y'all know a little bit about some other events that are upcoming through the LT and ITC in terms of training. Uh, you are right now in the quizzes in D2L, the basics. Um, next Monday, Lane Bryant is doing one on using Pulse, which is the mobile app for D2L. Um, I am sure that some of your students are using it because they're using their phones or tablets or things like that to go to class. Uh, so if you are noticing some of that, it may not be a bad one for you to attend. She'll tell you a little bit about how it works um, and some information that might help you better communicate with your students using Pulse. Um, and then next Friday at this same time, um, I am doing another D2L quizzes workshop. Um, and it is an advanced workshop and it's the, I didn't know I could do that. So it is um, all the things, well, most of the things in quizzes as much as we can cover beyond the basics. So it is the much more involved, um, detailed, um, some, some of the things that are a little bit more difficult to set up, a little trickier, uh, things like that. So um, that's what we're going to cover next week. So if there's something that you were looking to get out of this presentation that we don't get to because we're really just covering the basics, please make sure to go ahead and register for the one next week too because we may cover some things next week um, that will help you with some of those more intricate details within quizzes. Um, and then there are several others coming up as well. There's um, some effective teaching with Zoom. Um, there are some, there's a mindful meditation and practice. Lord knows we all need that. Um, and um, creating accessible content is coming up from the individuals with the FITSE. And then there's some more coming up in November. So make sure you're taking a look at the calendar for faculty development. It's in the stay on course for a faculty website through MTSU, and there are lots of programs, and Sheila and the folks over there in the LT and ITC do a really great job of providing some extra uh, development opportunities for y'all as we go through what can still be some strange times in the COVID. Um, so now that we've covered that, um, to talk a little bit about quizzes. So um, I always try to talk a little bit about some, some educational components. I'm gonna stop my share for just a second. Uh, to talk a little bit about some educational components and some processes, theories when applicable and things like that about uh, learning and our development resources and things as we are uh, discussing the, the different options and opportunities and things that, that happen within our classes. Um, and so I want to talk just a little bit this time about the formative and, assess and summative uh, issues with 
with quizzing and what that is. So formative is as we go. It's assessing as we go. It's looking at our learning um, as a pattern of where are things that, that we are doing well as students, where are things that we are not doing well as students, uh, what are some of the areas that we need a little bit more focus on. Uh, and that is beneficial for a faculty member to have those along the way because you can see if there's areas that a lot of your students might be struggling um, or if there's areas that they're really getting and you don't need to continue conveying that information quite as much. Um, you know, sometimes we go into a semester thinking, okay, these are the things that people struggle with. These are the things that people get um, typically right off the bat. And sometimes a, a group of students is the complete opposite of what we thought. Um, and we continue focusing on same topics to really make sure that there's understanding uh, when really they've gotten that and they're ready to move on to the next thing. So types of formative assessments really do help us uh, change and adapt our teaching as we go. Um, and it also helps our students be a little bit more aware of, um, well, you kind of didn't get that concept, so maybe you need to go back and revisit some of the resources, listen to a lecture over again, um, do a little additional reading in your textbook, see if there's some outside resources that might help you before we get to a summative assessment. So summative is, are the ones at the end of a unit. Um, or a module or a section or, or whatever we want to call them. And they're the ones that really determine um, what a student has got a hold of and knows as they're walking away. And those are usually the ones that we actually assign grades to, um, the ones that we tie to our grade book. Um, and so when we're thinking about quizzing, and thinking about different types of assessments and how we're going to go about quizzing. When we look at that, are we um, using quizzing only for summative and end of unit or end of midterm or end of, of course uh, as a what are the facts that you know or what are the things that you know, what are the things that you remembered uh, from this class and giving them that test we may or may not be really assessing all of their knowledge. So maybe thinking about using some quizzing to set up some self-assessments that students can take as they go, uh, potentially opening those up for as many attempts as they want um, and that participating in them is where the score comes from. Um, that maybe it's a, an idea for participation points if we're thinking about giving those in our class or um, we want to give them some rewards along the way for being actively engaged in the class. Potentially that's an area where you could do something like that. So setting a quiz up so that it's more like a self-assessment and multiple attempts, you know, they get all the attempts they want until they get 100 or, um, you know, they are able to go back and retake uh, an assessment as many times as they want can kind of help them with uh, that application and retention of information that they're getting from your lectures. Uh, so that's a little bit about that. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to address uh, while we're here uh, is cheating. Um, there seems to sometimes be a, a belief um, that online uh, leads to uh, increase in academic dishonesty. Uh, Studies out there don't actually show that. Uh, it's kind of an urban myth. Um, students online are actually no more likely to cheat on an assessment than students in a face-to-face -face class. Um, it's the same students, um, typically, <laughs> that are doing it in both places. They're not uh, taking ownership in their own learning uh, or not really seeing a lot of the value in the information. Um, you know, it's they're learning for a test and they're not really taking the time to learn for that test because they don't see how this applies to their later life. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to show y'all within the D2L quizzing tool um, and when we get to that point I am going to share my screen again and let y'all see the how we build the quiz but I strongly encourage you to, to minimize us uh, and turn on your D2L and feel free to walk through creating a quiz with me so that if you have questions or you run into something as you're creating your quiz, um, you can ask in real time. We're here for that to answer some of those questions for you. So when we get to that, please feel free to do that. Um, so 
but back to the, the cheating thing. Um, I know some of you have uh, started, well, I don't know if anybody in this group, but a lot of people have started using Examity, um, good, bad, or otherwise. Everybody has opinions. Um, have started using Examity to try to curtail some of that. But there are some other things that you can do within D2L to address that. Uh, but one of the biggest things about that is considering how you set your quiz up in the beginning and thinking about whether or not you want your quiz to, or exam or test, uh, whatever you want to call it, to be um, a true authentic assessment of their learning um, and how they are gaining that information and applying that information. Do they know where to find the information? Do they know how to apply the information? There are very few times, um, and I can't actually think of any write-offs, um, somebody might have one, but there are very few times in life um, outside uh, in, in our real world environments that we work in a vacuum that does not allow us to communicate with others, that does not allow us to view our, our resources that might be available through um, checklists or um, journals or coworkers or books or references um, or different things like that. And I am so sorry about my dogs. Sorry. Um, you know, there's very few times in life that we're like that. Um, but in, in testing, um, coming up through K-12 and then it continues in higher education, we tend to put people in a situation where they have to give you an exact answer um, kind of out of a out of what would be the norm in their real life. Um, remembering a very specific detail um, or remembering, um, you know, some some specific process that that after they do it a few times, you're going to remember it out of out of just the fact that you've done it. Uh, but the first few times you do it, you're always going to have somebody there with you. They're going to be watching. They're going to be checking. You're going to have a checklist of processes. You're going to have that information. So, kind of thinking about quizzes and whether or not um, it's that bad of an idea to have open note, open book, open resource tests. Um, and I'm going to expand on that just a little bit, um, just so that we, we are thinking about that. By that, I mean, we're going to have, um, having a, a quiz or an exam in D2L and allowing students to use, um, their books or their class notes or, uh, information that's available to them that just gives them the opportunity to kind of get some reassurance if they're not 100% sure. Um, they can go kind of look up, oh, hey, I remember we talked about that. I think it's this, let me go double check. And they go look at their their notes and they say, yep, I got it. That's exactly what's in my notes. Um, and, and you may be thinking, oh, well, they're not necessarily preparing. Well, that's, they're in that moment reaffirming what they've learned and using it and that puts it into more of our long-term memory anyway. Um, but in that, if you have a 30 or 40 question test and you give them an hour to do the test, if the student has not watched any of your lectures, has not read any of your notes, has not read any of the textbook or any of your additional resources, it is impossible for them to answer all 30 of those questions in that very short 60 minutes. Um, they're not going to be able to do it if they haven't pre-studied. So you're going to know and they're going to show you in their grade whether or not they were prepared for their test. Um, the students that do prepare ahead of time and have, you know, reviewed notes and watched lectures and have read their textbook and have really taken the opportunity to be active and engaged in their own learning, they're not going to actually need the full 60 minutes because they're going to have that information and even if they need to go look up one or two questions that they weren't certain on, they're, they're not going to need to look up all of it. Um, so they're still going to be able to go through the, the test and you're going to be able to see that, that they have actually been studying, they have actually been using that information, retaining it. Um, and in that, thinking about having some test questions and some activities within your quizzes that are more authentic assessment and application of information uh, that has been learned throughout the class instead of fact, 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 more here is this fact, tell me how you would apply this in your life or in your career or in a situation like this. Um, if we were in a lab environment and you were given these chemicals, how would you 
ensure safety or what kind of compounds would be created if these were the various chemicals that were available, name five that you would create. That's a, a different way of asking the same questions um, about how things like that might be created or what kind of knowledge or information that we have. Um, so I just kind of want to throw that out there a little bit because it's really kind of a concept in terms of, of assessing and teaching and, and how we're doing that. And we wanted to cover that a little bit before we get into the specifics of quizzing. Does anybody have any questions before I uh, screen share and we go to setting up a quiz? Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to screen share again and we're going to go through setting up a quiz step by step. So feel free to minimize, um, minimize me. Um, I hope you could have done that already. I'm okay with that. Um, feel free to minimize me and set up your D2L and we will start setting up a quiz. Okay. So we are in um, one of my development shells. Um, I'm not actually sure which one, so we'll just go to one that I don't think has quite as much stuff in it, so it's a little bit easier for us to see. Um, so within a course, when you click on the course and it takes you to your main homepage, when we go to assessments, which um, it some classes people take and change their nav bar and pull out specific. So quizzes may be something that's across your nav bar. I do not. I use things embedded in assessment. Um, it, it makes more sense to me. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier for students if things are consistent across courses and they're not having to search for things. This is, this nav bar is the model that comes from MTSU's FITSI um, when we give you a shell in D2L. Um, so this is how it looks. So I, I don't change the nav bar, but if you do, that's great. That's fine. Um, but if you don't, then within the assessment, you'll go to quizzes. Hey, Dr. And then Dr. Can you, yes. Can you zoom your screen so it's a little bigger? I absolutely can. Is that a little bit better for everybody? You need it bigger. I think that should be better. Okay. I will let you know otherwise. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, right, I can't tell how big because, you know, our screens are kind of big. Um, we have fancy instructional designer screens, so we can't really judge what other people's necessarily look like. Uh, so from quizzes, you have some options of manage quiz, question library, and statistics. So the quiz conversations that we will have next Friday, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about question library. Um, so if you're interested in that, please feel free to come back next week. Just know that that is one of those categories that's a little bit more advanced. Um, but it's there. I just thought you should know. It's actually where you can store questions uh, that are not in an active quiz at the time. Um, you can pull them into your quiz. So, um, but that's what question library is. Um, so, and then statistics will actually give you statistical information on your quizzes uh, as a whole, uh, or you could do that on individual quizzes. So, from the manage quiz screen, we're going to go to new quiz, which is the big blue button that says new quiz. And I am going to create a new quiz. You do have to put in a title. Uh, for your quiz or it will not allow you to save and set up on additional pages. So Okay, so this one is just the sample for this presentation. I do not have categories for my quizzes. Uh, you might um, If you have ones that are quizzes and others that are uh, self-assessments or you have quizzes, self-assessments and exams, you may actually set up categories uh, within your quizzes. That is completely and totally up to you. Um, I don't have any in mind, but that is what that is. Um, so I'm going to actually go through a few things in here before I add some questions because I want to show you some of this stuff without the extra question information. Um, so no category. I'm going to skip right over quiz questions for just a second and I'm going to go down to description and introduction. So I encourage you to add a little description and or introduction into your quiz for every single quiz. Otherwise, it just shows up as click here to take this quiz. Um, and the number one thing that I encourage you to put in your description and introduction is please do not log in through pipeline 
to take a quiz. Pipeline times out and your students won't know that they have timed out and are no longer actively in D2L until they go to submit. And then that can cause some issues for you and for them when they try to submit their quiz because they're no longer timed out. And if you allowed one attempt and that attempt is timed, that quiz, that's some time that's messed up and they're gonna panic and they're gonna send you a million emails and panic. So the number one thing, do not log in to take a quiz through Pipeline. Encourage them to log in from the mtsu.edu main webpage, go to quick links and click on, click on the D2L page from there. Um, if they happen to know the web, web address, it is elearn.mtsu.edu and they can go straight to that or you can link that directly in your description if you want to. Um, but again, do not go to quizzes, do not log into D2L to take a quiz through Pipeline because it could time out um, and we don't want students to lose their testing. Um, the second priority to, do, to um, add into your description is to make sure they hit submit at the end. Just saving does not submit the quiz. They have to click submit in order for their quiz to submit uh, and be uh, available for either auto grading if you have auto grading set up um, or for you to manually grade and uh, and put the information in there. Otherwise, it, it's not there. Um, it's not available for that. So um, and then there's some some interesting steps that we have to take to get in from the, the backside and you actually would have to probably talk to one of us or someone at the FITSE to help you through making that a possibility for your students. So just encourage them not to use pipeline and encourage them to submit. Um, those are the two big things that if you can put those in your description and, and or instruction, that is very helpful for you and the additional questions you have to answer down the road for your students. Um, and then scrolling on down the page, um, these are pretty. Um, it's if you want to put some information in there about your course or your quiz um, or information that might um, have to do with that specifically. But this is not where questions go. It is really just headers and pagers so that your quiz has a specific layout. Um, and then we're going to look down here at um, optional advanced priorities. Um, so this is one of the ones I wanted to hit first, and I, I think it's one of the ones that we can talk about that kind of addresses that cheating concern just a little bit, um, but I wanted to talk about these. So allowing hints, there's a way for you to put hints into your questions. That is a way advanced thing. So allowing hints has to do with whether or not you have put hints into your quiz questions. So this one probably isn't gonna apply to you on a regular basis. Disable right click. Um, if possible, uh, wherever you are on whatever screen you're on, I would love for you to highlight a word anywhere on your screen and then right click. Um, if you can see from mine, uh, because this isn't saved, it hasn't disabled it yet, but if you can see from mine, when I right click, it says copy, search Google for advanced, print or inspect. If you disable the right click while they're in the quiz and the quiz is turned on, the one that says search Google for advanced disappears. So if you are concerned about students popping out and looking up answers outside of your quiz, um, that is one that you may want to consider doing. Now, if you have open note, open book, open resources, don't worry about disabling the right click. Uh, because even if they're learning from Google, they're at least taking a moment to go out and look at something outside of the class. And um, there's been a couple times that faculty have told me that that they they don't actually stop students from doing that because sometimes the information in Google isn't 100% accurate or it's not what they said in the class. So um, they'll get the answer wrong on the quiz if they actually use the Google. So, um, but I wanted to show that one to you pretty early on because a lot of people ask about what does that mean? Um, and that's what that means. If you disable your right click, you cannot right click on the word and then just be taken to the internet. Um, so it's up to you whether or not you do that. And then the next one is disable pagers and alerts. So that addresses that if they are on um, a phone or a tablet or even their a desktop or laptop, um, pagers and alerts deal with they're not going to get a notification that they got a text message 
or an email message um, or any of those things like that. And that may sound fantastic to start with, but one of the other things it doesn't do, um, if you disable pagers and alerts, it will not give them the timer pop-up in D2L because that is considered an alert. So if you want students to be able to see the time remaining on a timed test, um, then you're not gonna wanna disable that. Uh, you do not need to set up notification email. That sends you an email every time somebody submits a quiz. And my guess is you don't want that because you're going to see it when you log into your grading or the quizzes within D2L. So I would strongly encourage leaving that blank. Um, so those are the settings and such that are on this page just to start with. Uh, so I'm going to come back up here to the top and I'm going to add a question. And I'm going to add a couple of questions as we go so you can see what they look like. And then it will also show you a couple of new um, steps and parameters that become available once we add questions. So here we go. Let's add a question. So when you first add your very first question, a page pops up um, that says add or import. And I'm going to address these pretty quick. So import is if you have a file, um, potentially like a test bank that you got from a publisher that is actually in the D2L format, you can import that right here as upload a file. Um, one of the other imports is to browse the question library. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're going to talk about the question library in the advance, but once you have a question library, you can actually import information straight into your quiz from the question library. Um, and then also learning repositories. That has to do with um, how things are tied in as external learning tools. And uh, initial thoughts may be that that will work with an external publisher. It, it doesn't typically work that way, um, you'll need to get a downloaded CSV from the publisher of a test bank and upload it as a file in order to work, for it to work correctly in about 99% of cases. Um, so we're going to just go with add. Um, and, and you can create sections within your quiz. So if you wanted to create a section for multiple choice, a section for matching, a section for written response. You can create individual sections for each of those areas. Um, that's up to you. Um, if you create sections, then there's some additional things that you have to kind of change around a little bit. But if you know that you want to have a section that is um, multiple choice, true, false, matching, and then you know you want to have a section that is written response, it's maybe not a bad idea to have one section that is specifically dedicated to written response. Um, question pool, that one, uh, that deals with having things set up in your question library. So again, next Friday, we're gonna talk about that. So this time we're just gonna go with a new question. So when you click on new question, you get several options to look at. And we are not going to go through all of these today. Um, there's just not actually enough time. I'm going to hit on the, the major priority ones. So multiple choice. I am choosing multiple choice. You need a question text. You can either type this in or you can copy it from um, any kind of other resource you have. So if you have a Word file of a test that you've given in person for a long time, uh, you can actually copy the information over. You just highlight it, copy it, and then you come over here and paste it in. I do encourage you to paste as plain text because it makes the text easier to read in the, the question. And to do that, you right click and say click paste on, on plain text. So MTSU is located in... And we are going to add some options. So Murfreesboro, Smyrna, Atlanta, and Nashville. So here we have this. This is, it is located in Murfreesboro. So we click that and it associates that as being the correct answer for this quiz. So if we decide to have our quiz auto graded, the system now knows that that is the answer, and if somebody guesses anything else, then they get that one wrong. You can add as many answers as you need. You can also delete them. So if we didn't want four, we only wanted three, we could come in here and we could delete it and move it down to three. 
Here is one of the other ways that if you are concerned about um, students helping each other take their tests, um, randomize answer order. If you click that on anything that is a multiple choice item, when the student gets this question, every student will get it in a slightly different order. Now, there are only three, so there there's only three different ways it's going to happen, but it's a different order. So if we were all sitting in a room together and we were taking this test at the same time, the people sitting right next to each other, the chances of them getting the answers in the same order are not very good. So you're not going to have somebody go, the answer to one is C. Because for me, the answer may be A. For you, the answer may have been B. For someone else, the answer may have been C. Uh, and then we can save. And we now have one question in our quiz. So I'm going to go ahead and create another question for you. Um, and I'm going to do a multiple select question. So that is when you have things that students can pick more than one option. Um, so title is a little deceptive. We don't necessarily need a title because it will show you just the question. So our question is MTSU, MTSU's colors are. Now you can add an image and put a description in here. So if you have something that you want to put an image up there, like if you have a, a molecule in a chemistry class, say, and you want them to be able to select what the different components are, you can actually put an image in there and they would be able to do that. Um, these are some enumeration options if you want things numbered and in different orders. Um, the biggest one to, to note here is, is it all or nothing? So do they have to get all of it right in order to get points? Do they get some points if they get some correct? Um, do they get the right, but if they get things wrong, you subtract some of the wrong from the right? I am an all or nothing kind of person with a whole lot of things, um, but there's also ones if you have a lot of options and you want to give partial credit, say they have to name three um, and they name two to the three, do you want to give them no points? Or are you okay with giving them two points? Um, so that's you having to figure out how you want to do that. So just for this opportunity, I'm going to say all or nothing. Again, you can randomize your options here. So that would make those multiple selects come up in a different order for every student. So I randomize my options. My values are blue. Um, and just so you know, you can add some feedback for each individual response. And you could do that in multiple choice as well. Um, but that's a little more detailed uh, in how those different options happen. So again, this is a pretty basic how to do this. Um, we know that blue is correct. So I'm going to click the correct button. Purple is not correct. So I'm not going to click the correct. White is correct. And orange. We know orange is not correct because that's at school up in Knoxville and we know that's not right. Um, so those are my options for that one. Do you remember earlier when I mentioned that there was a hint? Here if you enable hints and you add hints you can actually put your hint in here. Um, so you can add an additional hint that says click all that apply or whatever you would like to add into here to help students know better what needs to go there. You can also put automatic feedback into the question so that if a student gets it wrong, you can actually have feedback go to them or write actually. You can just have the question feedback go in there right then. So when the student gets the, the question, they get automatic feedback. Um, so that is our uh, random select, our multiple select question. So we're gonna hit save. And then we're gonna do one more, um, and then I'm gonna show you a couple of more things. Um, true, false is just like multiple choice. Um, you just put your two in there and you select the one that's correct. Um, written response is an essay or at least a long response. So if you plan to have something that is a paragraph or longer, I encourage you to use written response. Um, I can show you really quick what that looks like. So, Oh, that was a little crazy. Um, so this is where your information would go. Um, 
one of the things I would encourage you to allow on this one is enable them to do HTML editor in the learner response because what that opens up is the ability for them to insert images, insert um, videos if they need to, insert documents if they need to, but also they can, um, if they need to italicize something or bold something or subscript uh, or any other things like that that you may need in your responses, they need the HTML editor to be turned on in order for them to do that. Otherwise, it's just basic text. So I encourage that. It is up to you whether or not you allow images um, and attachments. So that is a written response. Uh, the one other one uh, that I was going to show you and then got distracted by the, the written um, is actually the short answer. So one of the things that I, I want to encourage y'all to think about with this um, is within D2L, um, let's uh, remember it's a computer and it's not a person. So if you, and this applies to fill in the blank or multiple short answer as well, um, when you put in a question, your answer needs to include all of the options that you will accept. So if the answer... Um, if the answer to our question is lightning, are we going to allow it to be capitalized, not capitalized, and any other variation of spelling? Uh, so any of those that you are willing to accept, you will need to add into these blanks. So I would suggest if you were gonna ask about our mascot that you do it with a capital L and with a lowercase L, uh, at least. Uh, there may be others. So the same thing with, um, Sometimes we run into this with uh, accounting questions when we're working on accounting quizzes and, and options. Dollar sign, no dollar sign, comma, no comma, uh, the decimal point and the zero, zero, uh, all of those things, if you are willing to accept all of those, you need to put all of those into that question blank so that if you are auto grading, it knows to accept those. If you're not worried about auto grading, you do not have to put multiple options. That can be put in there just for yourself. But if you are wanting to auto grade and you're using short answer, you will need to put all of the variations of the answer that you want to give. So I just wanna make sure that we know that going into it. Um, okay, so we have some questions now and we're ready to go back to that main page to see it and look what it looks like. So we go back to the settings for this quiz by clicking the top information. Our quiz now shows up again, and it now has our three questions that we created. So I don't know if you noticed, but a couple of additional options popped up right here that I wanted to go over with you. Um, one of them is go ahead and shuffle your questions at the quiz level. So remember earlier when we shuffled um, our answers at the question level? Well, if we shuffle our questions at the quiz level, uh, the chances of any two people, I mean, with three questions and three answers, we might have some duplication in this group, but if you have 30 questions and you have 30 students in your class, they're not going to get their questions in the same order. Questions are going to come in a different order. Question responses are going to come in a different order. You are not going to have people taking their quiz in the exact same order. So you won't have somebody that says the answer to question one and C because nobody else in the class has the same question one. Um, so that's how you find out whether or not somebody's doing something they maybe shouldn't be doing. So shuffling at the quiz level is a really simple way to just add an extra layer of that. And that applies whether it's open note, open book, open resource or anything, it doesn't hurt for them to come in a different order. And if you're using auto grading, D2L will auto grade for you. So the next one that's to think about is whether or not you want questions per page. Um, we don't need to apply questions per page necessarily in this scenario because we only have three questions. But if you are going to have um, a 50 question exam, that's a lot of questions on one page for students to scroll through. So maybe think about limiting that to five or 10. So they're not scrolling through as many. Um, and all you do is that you simply put in the number, you click apply, and then um, there is a purple line that showed up on my screen that showed how often those uh, questions are broken up. So if you did a five and you clicked apply, that would mean that five would be in each of those blocks. Um, and that would be five based on 
however the order is. So when you shuffle, it will shuffle that way. One thing to note, when you put um, shuffle on your quiz, if you have written responses and you plan for those to be at the end, shuffling is a little bit more difficult and you need to go in and actually create a section so that you are not shuffling at the quiz level for written to be mixed in with a bunch of multiple choice questions. So um, again, that's something else we can discuss in the advance down the road, but that's just something to think about in terms of questions and paging. Um, I do not click the paging prevent moving backwards through paging. I do not click that um, partially because in uh, the education classes that I took early on and the assessments and how to take tests and how to give tests and all of those things like that um, in my early education career, um, it was that when you have a test, go through, start at the beginning, go all the way through and answer all of the questions that you feel confident about and do those first and then go back to the beginning and start working on the ones that you had questions you weren't sure about, you didn't feel 100% confident about. If you prevent moving backwards through the pages, it means that students can't do that. They can't go through and answer all the ones that they feel super confident about and then go back to the beginning. They have to answer as they go through. Now, if you prefer for them to answer one before they go to the next one and you do not want them to be able to go back, click that prevent moving backwards through the pages and that prevents that. Um, so it, it only applies if you have pages set. Um, but it's up to you. That's a decision that you have to make for yourself and your quizzing and how you want your students to go through the class. Um, so now that we've looked at the basics on this page, uh, I wanted to take a look at some restrictions with you and have some conversations about those. So some basic restrictions, like we already put some shuffle on our answers. We put shuffle on our question. We put pages, we disabled our right click. We've already got some restrictions, um, but these restrictions are a little bit different. So when you first create a quiz, hide from user always clicks first. You have to go in and manually unhide it. So there's a couple of, of tips on that. Uh, leave it hidden if you're creating it in an active class. Um, don't unhide it until you're done building it because uh, if you haven't put open available dates on it and you have it unhidden, students will see it. Um, so just go ahead and leave it hidden until you're ready for it to exist in the world. Because um, they'll freak out if they see a quiz that they didn't know existed or if they see it pop up. So just go ahead and leave that hidden for now. Um, go ahead and set your end dates and due dates and, and start dates. So uh, your start date, if you want it to be available, um, so say I want mine to be available later on today at 1 p.m. today. I don't recommend that. I recommend building a quiz slightly before you need to use it. Um, but you want it to be available at 1 p.m. today. Um, and then you want it to be due. Um, well, we'll just go ahead and leave it at, at the time that it says it's going to be due. Um, and that's when it's due. They can submit it up to that point. Uh, you, if you've been using D2L at all, you know that there is a difference between due and end date. Due date is when it's due. Um, students can still turn it in late. If it's due and doesn't have an end date and it shows up with a little key that says this was however many hours late, end date means it's closed, it's shut down, they can't get into it, nothing can happen. I'm, I'm not against end dates for quizzes and such things like that, but I strongly encourage your end date to be probably about 10 to 15 minutes after your due date, only to give just a little bit of time just in case something goes a little bit crazy uh, in terms of time or for whatever reason, students lose connectivity or something like that. If you set your end date at the exact same time and somebody submits it, it may not accept it. And then you have to go back in and do a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes to allow it to submit. Of course, some of that comes back to you and whether or not you want them to be able to submit it late. So um, you've already got a time set on your availability. So I don't know that you need a release condition, but if you need a release condition, you can add release conditions here. Possible release conditions might be if you decide you want to have um, like multiple choice, true, false matching as a quiz. And then in order for them to do the essay portion of your quiz, they have to have submitted the multiple choice section. Then you can actually create a release condition that you have a separate 
written response essay portion of your quiz and it's that they have to submit the other portion for the written one to open um, that's another thing we'll probably go over next week um, so on down here I don't encourage you to put a password um, unless you need to um, because that's just one more step that could cause some issues with students um, and and how they get access to the quiz and it's one more time that you might have to answer a whole lot of questions um, so it's about not creating additional steps for you too so earlier we talked about enforced times so if you are doing um, self-assessments that you're not worried about how much time it takes them to do it then you can just leave the time as it is um, but if this is a summative assessment and you want them to have a set amount of time then you are going to want to click on the enforced time limit and then you're going to want to set the time a 10 question little bitty quiz um, over some basic stuff that you normally would have given at the beginning of your face-to-face -face class in the first 10 or 15 minutes does not need 120 minutes of time um, so think about your time in relation an exam two hours um, how much time would you have had in your face-to-face -face class to give this assessment? That's how much time you want to give in this class. It shouldn't be different for online or remote than it is for face-to-face -face in amount of time. So our quiz has three questions. <laughs> so hopefully it wouldn't take them more than five minutes to answer this. Um, I encourage a grace period just because things happen in life. Um, so I encourage a grace period because ours is a five-minute quiz we don't really need a five minute grace period but you do have to give a grace period if you are allowing this so you got to give a grace period one minute is usually all you need I encourage for longer exams for about five minutes and then you're going to want to determine how you want them to continue moving through the class so allowing a student to continue working that means the time didn't matter there was no point in us putting an enforced time on it um, the second one, prevent the student from making further changes. That stops them immediately when that time passes. They cannot answer any more questions. They don't lose their quiz. Nothing happens to their quiz. It exists, they submit, but they can't make any other changes to any additional questions or activities. The third one, um, you would allow the student to continue working, but automatically score the attempt at zero. Um, I mean, you can do that. That seems kind of harsh to me, but you can if you need to do that i tend to always put mine at prevent the student from making further changes um, and then the final column under restriction deals with ada compliance um, so if you have somebody who needs an additional access to a quiz this is where you would put that information in so that's the basic gist of the restrictions because we have put our start date and end date on this i'm going to go ahead and unhide this so that it is available if you don't unhide your quiz at some point even when the availability time passes it will not be visible to students so just double check when you're getting close to the time for a quiz to start or an exam to start in one of your classes make sure that it is visible to the user um, we're going to go ahead and click over to assessment hey dr goblin will you go over <laughs> what you said again about end dates please on quizzes yes yes Yes, so due date means it's the time that it's due. This is what time you expect them to turn it in. An end date means it is gone, it is no longer available, they cannot get into it at all. Um, I encourage for your end date to be a few minutes after the due date just in case there's a technology issue in the world. I'm sure none of you have had technology issues in the last seven months. Um, so I, I just, do that for my own safety and well-being um, it helps prevent some issues um, it does mean that if a student starts a quiz late because that is one of the things about the enforced time is that they can start it up until the due date um, it does mean that if a student starts late uh, that they would actually be able to do it um, but it will show you as being a late it's late it comes up it actually shows a little key and a time that the student was late in submitting it. Um, so if a student decides or forgets or waits till the very last possible minute to start a quiz, um, it would tell you that it was late, but you wouldn't have to go in and manually override something. Um, but at the end, 
when it shows up as ending, your your times would happen. So an end date just gives you a final closing time. And I just recommend that it be a couple of minutes after your due date, um, just because it gives that buff buffer for technology glitches. Did that help a little bit? Okay. Yes, I thought that's what you had said and she asked and I would have answered, but I, I was answering other questions and I didn't hear what you said, sorry. It's okay, no, you're fine. <laughs> okay, so with assessment, um, oh, it's about 12.30, so if anybody needs to go, please, no, I'll just keep talking. It'll be recorded and available. Um, it's because we took a couple minutes to do the midterms at the beginning, so sorry about that. Um, so in assessment, our quiz, because we set correct answers, we can allow it to be auto-graded upon completion. Um, so it will auto-grade. It will auto-grade everything that has an auto-grade. If you have written response in your exam, and you set it to auto grade, please somewhere in an announcement, in your instructions, in the information that you provide to students about the quiz, please let them know that auto grade does not apply to written response. So the grade they get will only be based on the automatic grades. Just make sure that you know that and you tell them that so that that tells them. Um, one way to prevent that um, is to not allow the auto export to grade because you can always push it later. Um, so if you want it to be set to be graded immediately upon completion and you want it to auto export to your grade book, normally you would already have the grade items set up. I don't because this isn't a normal class. So I'm just going to create one. I don't have any categories. I don't need any of that. Um, my maximum number of points was three. It can exceed. Do you want it to be more than three? Did you allow for bonuses? Is it a bonus question? Is it excluded from the, the final calculation? These are all things that you would have done when you set it up in your grade book. Um, so we're going to hit save. I now have a grade item. So I'm going to allow this to be automatically graded. It's now tied to this grade item, and I'm going to allow it to auto export, which means when a student completes this quiz, it automatically goes into the grade book. It automatically gets graded. It automatically goes into the grade book. Um, so that's awesome if that is if that meets the needs of what your quiz needs. So I mentioned in the very beginning about unlimited attempts or three attempts or multiple attempts. So this is where that attempts information is. It is under the assessments tab. So you can allow unlimited, or it actually numbers up to 10. So um, depending on what you want, uh, you can do this as many times as you want and allow them to um, keep whatever one you want them to keep. Um, you can set that up as many ways as you want. Uh, but the number of attempts, so you may only want them to have one attempt and that one score may be it. Um, so you'll have one attempt and then uh, leaving it at highest attempt is fine. It doesn't change anything. If you have one, it's, it's obviously your highest. It's also your lowest, your first, your last. Um, so it automatically sets as your highest attempt. So you can just leave it at that. But say you wanted to give them three tries and you wanted to apply your three tries. Um, I'm going to allow three and I'm going to have it be the highest attempt. So I don't know if you noticed, but when I set it to three, a whole bunch of shenanigans popped up down here. Um, this is if you want additional attempt options. So they don't have to take it again. If they get 100 the first time, they don't have to take it again. If they get a 70 the first time and they don't want to take it again, they don't have to take it again. These additional attempt options are if you want to set a criteria that says, you can only get a second attempt if you got in this range. You can only get a third attempt if you got in this, this range. That's a whole lot of extra steps for you. So it's usually easiest to just say three, highest attempt is kept, and you're good to go. Um, you also have the option, I don't know why you would want to keep the lowest attempt, but you do have the option to keep the lowest attempt, uh, or you can average their attempts. Um, so if you want them to have multiple attempts and you want to take the average of those attempts, you can do that as well. Because do you remember if we have shuffle of questions and shuffle of answers, every time they take the quiz, they're going to get a different quiz. Um, so you may want to do an average of them or you may want to just keep the highest. Um, so for me, 
I'm good with whatever works for you, but this is typically how I would do it, um, is that I would have it high, keep the highest and give them multiple opportunities. Uh, so those are the basics of setting up a quiz. There are all kinds of other things that we can talk about. We're definitely going to talk about a whole lot of those uh, when we get to the advanced one next week. Um, Anybody have any questions at this point about basic quiz setup? Oh, sorry, I should save and close that. But what kind of questions do y'all have about basic quiz setup at this point? I know Tara's been rocking and rolling the chat questions, but I didn't know if there were any that y'all wanted to bring up live that we can discuss uh, or any questions that you have. Can you talk about Safari for a minute? Mac at Safari with quizzes? <laughs> that was one of the questions that we did have. Um, and so, and I, I was trying to go back and look at where I saw it. Oh, it was where, where you, um, you said to, to click to um, enable or disable their access to Google. Yeah, the right click. Yeah, that uh, doesn't apply and, to a Mac. Uh, so, and, obviously, that's for the, the student, right, if they're using the Mac. So, should I tell them not to use Safari or? Uh, well, I or <laughs> well don't use ie mm -mm. right well, um i don't even think that's supported anywhere anymore but um so d2l um works best in chrome okay um it works second best in firefox um and then on down from there um they it's not so much that D2L can't work in Safari. Most of the issues with Safari actually come in from the Safari security settings. Because um, Safari and Apple have some intense security settings that sometimes make things like a hint pop up or an alert pop up or something like that that you actually are expecting to have happen in D2L not happen um, because they have some security settings. So. I encourage people to use Chrome um, or Firefox whenever possible. Um, but if they're only using Safari, then um, I mean, it, it's fine. The only thing so far that I know Safari doesn't work with is video note. Um, and that again is a Safari security pop-up. Um, it's not a D2L issue, it's a Safari issue. Um, but the right click has to do with whether or not you have a mouse that allows for a right click. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Godwin, yes. uh, just um, a piece of information. Um, I have an iPad Pro yes. and I use it for almost everything. Um, but when I'm designing a quiz, when you get to the bottom, you have to save. Mm -hmm. um, and my iPad Pro will not allow me to scroll down to save. I tried, I, I entered my entire exam four times. Um, the fourth time was on a PC because I could not get it to save. Is it only? I could see it. I could see the word save at the bottom, but it was not, you know, it was, if I'd scroll up. Uh-huh. I could see the word save, but I couldn't select it when I would let go so that it went back to where it was normally. I couldn't see it. To on, select was, it so. was it on all of the pages? Like all, all of the tabs? Like, did you try each tab? Yeah, couldn't. Okay. That's an interesting, that's interesting. So thing. I don't, I don't, know. I don't own Apple products. They make me mad. So, well, I've had, <laughs> um, I've had a lot of problems with my iOS uh, 14. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if perhaps it's related to that. It might. And are you using Safari? Because again, that kind of goes into no. it. Okay. No, I, I, I use Chrome. Okay. Um, and part of that is tablets just don't have some of the same abilities and settings as exactly laptops and desktops do, whether they're Mac or PC. Um, it's interesting though that it wouldn't let you click on it on any of the tabs like I can kind of see it on the first one because if you've entered a bunch of questions it's really really long and so it may like cause it to to not do it but like on the objectives page there's no that's it unless you have objectives so you there wouldn't be any scrolling so that's why I was curious if it if it did it in every single tab 
Yeah. Um, or if it was just in the properties tab. No, okay. it just did it everywhere. And, um, and I, of course, entered all of my questions and it didn't, and it wouldn't say. <laughs> so <laughs> she makes me sad for you. Um, I so I, so I, I said that we're going to talk about question library during advance, but we're going to quickly talk about question library real quick. Um, so question library, let's, let's tell you a little secret about question library. Uh, you can create all your questions in question library and then import them into your quizzes. So you are not typing directly into your quiz and trying to save as you go. Um, so, um, if you have access to a PC or a Mac desktop or laptop, this may be where you want to create some of your questions um, because then you're not typing them multiple times. Um, though as a safety, because your quiz already exists as a quiz, correct? In your class. Um, it does. So uh, one quick thing. Um, so <laughs> instructional designers will also tell you, this is the one thing about D2L I think that makes us nuts. Why is he calling it a section instead of a folder? Everything else in D2L is called a folder. Why are you going to call it a section here? Um, but they don't, they don't listen to me. Uh, so go ahead and create yourself a section. Um, and we're going to call it um, mm -hmm, save my quiz because we don't want to lose those questions ever again. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so once you do that, this is y'all's quick crash course. So now y'all are going to come back to advance so that we get a little bit more information on that. So we do a section. We're going to name it. Um, and when you click on that folder and it comes up just like this, uh, we are going to go to um, import and we're going to click on browse existing questions. And this whole new little pop up happens over here. And mm -hmm. over here in the right side um, is one that says source. And this actually is linked to every quiz in my class. So I can click on source. I can go down to sample for presentation because I think that's just the one we created. It's the three questions that I asked. I click this top left button. All three of my questions are selected. I click add. Holy moly, all three of those questions are now in my question library and they are saved forever. Oh my gosh. In my I wish question I had library. Known that a few days ago. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, they're now saved in my question library and they're saved forever in awesome. my question library. Um, and you can do that with every quiz or every everything that you take. Um, so that is the reverse way to use question library. Um, and it's probably not bad that we chatted about it a little bit because next time I will probably talk about creating it from the reverse, um, that we create it from scratch and we don't import quiz questions. Um, but all of you that were here just got this awesome little tidbit that if you have created a quiz in D2L for your, your own sake and sanity, um, feel free to create it into your quiz library because quiz libraries, um, just like quizzes, copy over into future question, future classes. If you copy your class, um, your question library will go with you, which also means that if you want to change your quiz over time, as you add more questions to your question library, it actually creates a more in-depth quiz, um, which is really what we'll talk about next time when we talk about advanced, um, is that we'll talk about how we do that in creating questions from your question library as opposed to creating a quiz and then, um, but it's about creating a broader scope of questions that way. So, but that is your, that, I hope that helps. I'm so sorry. I didn't know a few days ago. Thank you. <laughs> I would have told you, but I would totally encourage you at some point to go in and copy that over to your question library so that it's there and you're not manually typing um, the questions into your quiz and then losing the quiz. You're still manually typing into your question library if you're creating new there, but then they're there and it's not a quiz that you're having to constantly go in and and it may, it hurts Thank my you. heart that you did that. Thank I, I, you. Hate that. I like, I'm like, like my soul, like just kind of like, Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. That, Thank oh, you I very hate that. Much. Absolutely.
Uh, I know we're running over, so we got to wrap up, but we did have one question about special access. So can you okay. go back to that to kind of go over why you would use special access? Absolutely. I can go back to that. Um, so let's go back to quizzes. We have also had a lot of questions about feedback and submission views. I have stated that will be part of the deep dive next week. Yes. Yeah, that is one of the big things that we'll talk about next week is um, submission views and and feedback because it's there's so I mean we could probably talk about quizzes every week for the next six months um, and still not cover everything um, that is not a hint Sheila um, <laughs> okay so to look at our quiz uh, so here's our quiz again um, and it was under restrictions so under restrictions, down here under special access. Um, so under restrictions, you scroll to the bottom to get to special access. So um, the only things that I typically use the special access for are for students in my classes that have um, DAC accommodations or ADA accommodations, um, that they need extra time or that there are certain parameters that are set with that. So um, the, the way that the way it's automatically set is to allow selected users special access to quiz. So that's actually the one you probably want. Um, if you click the other one, it means everybody else in class doesn't get access to the quiz. It's only the person that you get access to gets access to the quiz. So you probably want the ones that says allow selected user special access um, because then it doesn't interrupt the quiz for everybody else in your class. So I don't, there might be students in this class. Um, so the way that you do that is leave this as that top one um, selected, the allow selected users, and then you add users to special access. So this is what the add special access to quiz page looks like. Um, you will notice that it is a little different. So um, this one you would go in and you could leave your due dates and end dates the same if you need to, depending on how you have that set. Um, so for example, um, if you are giving them an hour to take the test, you're giving your whole class an hour to take the test, you're giving them a week to take the test. Um, but it's due by 1130 on, on the day that you're doing it. We're going to go back in time in this one. Um, you're doing it at 1130. It has to be done by 1130 on the day that it's due. So typically, your accommodation does not allow, is not to give them that extra week beyond the due date. They had a week to take it. Um, it typically is having more time to take the test. Now, it is possible that you will have somebody that requires the extra amount of time that assignments get extra time. Um, and some of those you will probably going to want to reach out to the DAC and get some clarification. They will work with you on that uh, to help you better understand if you gave them a week to take the test, um, you may not need to give them additional days to take the test as long as you have the time available. It is possible that they will um, have um, additional time limits. So in that scenario, mine was 60 minutes or mine was five minutes. So for this one, if they were to get twice as much time, then you would say that they get an additional 10 minutes. Um, or you would um, recommend it up, like I, this is recommended, so it's actually the enforced. So for mine, it would be 10 minutes, and I said um, that they were getting one minute, so I'm going to go ahead and give them two minutes, and I'm just going to double everything. So if you have a student that for an hour-long quiz, um, and normally they get an, a, twice as much time, you would change that from 60 minutes to 100 minutes, and then it, the grace period is not actually where that applies. It's up to you whether or not you extend the grace period, um, but you could allow that. Um, you can also, depending on what their accommodation requires, uh, you may have to change the whether or not you allow them to continue working. Typically, you're okay with the prevent the student from making further changes, um, but just double check. It should be in the accommodation email that you get from the DAC, but just double check it. Um, and then these, I already set mine for three, but they may be allowed an additional 
time to take it. Um, everybody's is a little bit different. So um, it's looking at what the DAC tells you. And if you have one of these, especially the first time, please feel free to give us a call. We can help you work through some of those specifics. So I am going to give my uh, fake student one. Uh, man, there's all kinds of awesome people in this class. There's four personalities for me. There's one for Tara. There's, um, so I'm going to give fake student one special access. So I have extended the time that they can take this test and I am giving them special access. So now that fake student one has special access, if you scroll back down to the bottom of that release conditions page, um, there it shows that it, I didn't change the date. That's my own fault. But um, there it shows that they now have 10 minutes um, for that. And it only applies to that student. So when I save and close, I should have changed the date. Um, when I save and close, was, this was the one, right? And then I go back in and I look at this test. Oh, it was on the restrictions page. Goodness gracious, y'all. Um, it will show that that's what save and close. It exists. This person has that access. So that's what special access is specifically for. You can also tell that you've done special access when you save and close that there's a little key looking mm -hmm. um, icon. Could think of that word. Next to the quiz, yep. as you see in Dr. Godwin's quiz, now it has a little key thing, and that yep. means special access has been set correctly. Yes. Or it's been set, not necessarily. Yeah, I don't know but that it was correct. <laughs> I mean, I set it back in time. I'm, I got my own little DeLorean. We're ready to go. Um, yeah, so it, it'll tell you if you did it. So. Um, yeah. Something that I've found with the special access has actually happened to me last week. I went through, I have several students with accommodations. So I went through all my quizzes and set their special access. Then I changed the due date for the rest of the class. It doesn't automatically update special ac access. You have to go in and manually change yeah. special access if you change the settings for the quiz. Yes, yes, you do. I'm oh, sorry. It'd be nice. Maybe that's one of the new updates that'll come out next time. I think it's because the date itself can be changed within the special access. So it overrides any other changes that you make. I'm sure there's some awesome behind the scenes IT technology thing, coding that makes that happen. I, I don't know that. <laughs> what other questions might y'all have? I know we've gone a little bit over, but we're here. So we've, you've got us. So if you want to stay and ask questions. I can't figure out where to add to the question library. So I'm on, I'm in my quiz and I go to import. Are you in, so when you're on quizzes across the top, does it say manage quiz or question library? Okay, wait a second. Because uh, I probably sailed right over that step. So when okay. you're on your main quiz page and you're looking at your manage quizzes, click on the one that says question library. And then if you don't have anything in it, yours will probably oh, show up. Oh, I see. It'll show okay. up blank. And then add a new section and name it whatever you want to name it. Um, just okay. make sure it'll make sense to you later what you name it. I've done that before. Um, so <laughs> name it whatever you need to name it as a section. And then once you have that, once you have that folder, click on that folder and then import from there. I see. Okay, gotcha. We Thank told y'all this would be live work in progress if y'all ran into questions to let <laughs> us know. That's why we're here. <laughs> Our chat's been going crazy. I hope we're answering those questions. I have one question, Kim. Sure. Kim, so I had a problem yesterday. Yesterday, I have a test. So I have two sections, section three, section four. One section is in the morning, one okay. section in the afternoon so okay. i read the quiz it's called test one for section three people and then i see this quiz to the report repository so for section four i just load that from the repository so it's the same questions however in the first section the quiz is showing up everything shows correctly okay but, but for the second section, there's one question. 
I insert the image, but that image didn't show up for the second section. So I don't understand the reason because I use the exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you never have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if since it was in the learning repository, somehow the learning repository itself didn't understand that that was an image. That Yeah. Like that's all I can actually think of. Yeah. That's all I can think Maybe. of. Yeah. So, yeah. I learned something yesterday. <laughs> you can't. Well, hey, we just learned something new today. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> huh. That's interesting. I, yeah. We might have to look into that a little bit more. If you want to send one of us an email about that, we'll uh, sure, you know, yeah. we can check into that and see what's going on with that because that's that's interesting. Yeah. I've never seen that happen before. So, okay. no, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, the, we're not more help. <laughs> for the few people are, that are still hanging on and have time to see, could you add a bonus question to a quiz and what that would look like? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it would help if I actually clicked on quizzes instead of grades. <laughs> Usually we think of bonus items with grades. Yeah. Okay. Right there. What kind of question would y'all like? Okay. True false. True false. <laughs> that one's fast. I mean, at least I hope true is the answer to this one. Otherwise, we got a, we got a, we got an issue here. Okay. Done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I bet it would have really helped if I talked about that instead of just doing it, huh? I'm like, do, 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 do. Um, so what we did there was that we created a true false question and we saved it and it's that the I am true blue and true is the correct answer please. Um, so it added it right there and that is our new question. So the way, I'll, I'll just show you what it on here, the way to make something a bonus question and give it bonus points or like here's your extra little point for the test. So when you're looking at your questions and you have the uh, add edit questions right next to it is edit values. Um, so I know a lot of times we we see the one that we need and we don't necessarily pay attention to the extra things that are out here. This one allows you to change the value of your questions within the quiz itself, um, which is kind of awesome if you decide later that you want to change, um, like, oh, I think this is only worth one, but this matching one should be worth two, this written response should be worth five, and then I'm going to make this be a bonus. So we'll change some of our values here. We'll change this one to five. Um, and then this one, I want this one to be a bonus. So the way that you click on that is that you say bonus. And then when you save and close, it now shows up. Should have just saved instead of save and close. It now shows up as having this little bonus thing here. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but because I changed my point value, my total is now eight points instead of, of four. So I changed my point values to be um, one, two, and five, um, which gave me eight points. And then I added that one as a bonus. So uh, instead of it just being a four point question, I mean, a four point test is now eight point test with a bonus. So, and my bonus is worth one point. No, that was a great question. Thanks, Sarah. What what other questions do y'all have? I think we had gotten through pretty much all of them in the chat, and I knew we were doing submission views next week. We definitely will want to focus on submission views next week for sure. Yep, no problem. 
But I don't believe there was any questions left within the chat or that had gone through. Okay. I think we got them all. All I'm right. Well, still people who had questions, but. <laughs> no, that sounds great. Right. All right. I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to stop recording. Leave. <laughs>